At Home with Brian. I'm Brian and as you can see, I'm at home. I'm delighted to bring you three fabulous guests tonight for your visual and your oral pleasure. Boogie Woogie pianist Ben Waters is in Dorset in the UK. Young singer-songwriter Kian is set up at the Bakehouse Studio. And all the way over in the wild, wild west at Yikesville, one of my favourite performers to kick off the show. She'll soothe your soul, she'll rock and she'll roll. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rebecca Barnard.
Beautiful. Rebecca Barnard with, of course, tasteful accompaniment there from Shane O'Mara. Beck, I've always loved that song. Uh, a Rebecca's Empire song or maybe off your first record? That was penned by Shane and Stephen Cummings. Ah. 25 years ago. It has not aged a drop. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the song hasn't. But yeah, it was on the first Rebecca's Empire album and people loved that song. It was just one of those songs. Well, I think we all relate to that uh, flutter of excitement when the phone rings and we know who it might be on the other end. Sometimes we dread it though too, sometimes, don't we? <laughs> sometimes we dread it. Hey, Beck, did you make it back home all right after your jazz gig? Yeah, yeah. I actually, it was so nice to play with a band, you know, a yep. proper band. It was really, it was fantastic. It's really and, fun. Tell us about the band. Um, well, it's John Montesante who um, had the band in the 80s, Grand Wazoo. Yeah that a few people out there will remember. And he's a trumpet player and um, he's, he's, he's been playing jazz forever, like me really, you know, just, it's just another sort of string to our bows or whatever. And he's, he collects um, clothing from the Civil War, which is kind of interesting. He wears a little Civil War cap, if they, I don't know if they've got a proper name or whatever. Um, and it was um, uh, Hugh Harvey on drums, who's done the um, Heart of St Kilda many a time. And, yep. uh, oh gosh, I, I can't remember everyone, which is terrible. A big band, a big band. No, that's oh, okay. Yeah, just a great band, great band. Now, Beck, given your background, you grew up with grandparents, with uncles, with mums and dads who were all jazzers. Yeah. How, did, how did they react when you perhaps went a bit more R-O-C-K, rock? Um, Dad couldn't believe that it could take months to make a record. Really? No, nah, he just thought it was the most ludicrous thing. He goes, you know, we go in and we perform live and you know, they, they would make albums in three hours. You know, all those records on the Swaggy label, all those yeah. jazz records they they were probably made in three hours you never did i don't know i don't think they ever did overdubs or but you know that was sort of traditional jazz well not always traditional jazz but um and, and there was a lot of spontaneity in it you know that they, they didn't work out parts and stuff so it was just bang you know and there we'd be saying, right, we've got to mix it and master it and we've got to get a vibraphone here and get this here and that and he just he I think he thought it was a bit precious, you know? Yeah. Did he come and, and watch you play? Was he a, a, someone who would come and watch? Well, he lived in Sydney and um, I lived in Melbourne and he, whenever we went to Sydney, um, usually he had a gig as well. But he did come and see us one night at that gig in Roselle. What was that called? The something and something. Oh, it was a really good gig. The Rose and... Rose and Thistle. Rose and Thistle. Yeah. Yeah, and he lasted about 20 minutes because it was too loud. Too loud. Too loud. And it was. So, it was, was, all... your first, was your first performance with him or with any of the other uh, Barnard clan, those famous jazzers? Um, Can you remember the first time you were on stage? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It's really Tell us. Amazing. What good is sitting alone in your room? <laughs> I was, I was Liza Minnelli. Well, just for that song, and I had to, it was form two, so about 1974. And I remember I was so nervous. I had to hold a microphone, and my hands were just like this. Um, but I loved it, you know. Once it was over, I loved it. But the first time I performed with Dad was at Smacker's Place in North Melbourne. Yep. And I was 15 and he'd never seen me sing, really. And I did Georgia on my mind. And, um, and Nisha Fitzgibbon, the daughter of Smacker, 
she got up and did peel me a grape. Like she was really sort of sensuous and um, professional. And I sort of got up in the handicrafts of Asia, little dress and did, I mean, I think I sounded okay. I think I sounded quite good actually, but I just didn't have the confidence that she had. I'll, I'll never forget that. So it was it was a joy to be able to play with my dad. I he, bet. Did he give you tips and give you notes and help you out? More like don't get singing lessons. Don't don't let anyone sort of tell you how to do it. You yeah. know, almost a hippie approach, really. Yeah. Not that he was, but he was very. Um, he was a beautiful drummer. He was he was the singer's drummer. You know, he was so soft and if when needed but um well soft is often terrific uh, for drummers i remember our our pal stephen cummings always used to talk about the drumming of paul hester as being not too loud but yeah. with great swing you got a swing great group. I mean, I think if it ain't got that swing brian that's right. Hey, let's stay with the family for a little bit. One of the questions that I've been asking regularly is what sort of things were you doing the last time you were not allowed out? We're, we're sort of coming out of <laughs> the lockdown, but um, what was Rebecca Barnard doing as, a, say, a, a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old? I was living a very enchanted life. In what way? I uh, well, we lived in, um, I don't know if you've heard of Edna Walling, a famous yeah. landscape gardener. We lived on an Edna Walling estate in Moorlbark, Bickleydale oh, Road. Moorlbark. Moorlbark was bush in those days. Yeah, you know, foot with of the Dandenongs. Yeah, foot of the Dandenongs. And um, we had a quarter of an acre of garden and a creek running down the bottom of the garden. So... And mum was an incredible gardener, so I would do things like catch tadpoles, you know. Yeah. The um, there we had this beautiful lemon-scented gum with a big branch that I could climb on and pretend it was a horse. And I'd get I'd get mum one of mum's scarves and put it round, and that was the reins because I was so desperate for a horse. And I'd sit on this branch and pat it and everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny remembering this. And the McCalls lived down the road and they had, you know, Barney and John McCall are well-known Melbourne musicians. Yeah. And they had seven kids. So there was always one of their kids at our house or two. So we would um, we had a little uh, two foot six Clark's pool. So if it was hot, we'd swim around in circles and make all the leaves go to the middle. You know how you'd cr create that whirlpool? <laughs> So they're always something. I mean, always outside, rolling down hills, yeah. um, you know, hanging off the clothesline, just stuff and so, loving it. So vastly different from the upbringing that perhaps your son Harry has known, the beautiful Harry O'Mara. Yeah, pretty different. Pretty different. Do you ever yearn for it to be like that for him? always <laughs> i do and i wonder i i i i was thinking about this the other night you know this the world does progress and everything progresses and brains probably change yeah you know the progressive era um but no i do that was the good thing about iso you know there were a lot more pe kids out in the park sort of mucking around by the creek with sticks and stuff. So that, yeah, I, I don't know where the screen age is gonna leave all these kids. I, I really don't know. I suppose we'll find out. We'll find out, exactly. Well, hey, listen, find out. Uh, Rebecca, tell us what you're up to at the moment. I heard a whisper that there is a covers album coming. Yeah. Tell well, us. I've never done one before and, um, and I just thought, I mean, the main reason is because I do so many different sort of genres of music, which I've, I've done for years, you know, like Billy and I do did Stop Dragging My Heart Around on Rock Quiz and um, Jazz and sort of Joni Mitchell, 
my own songs and I've sung backing vocals with so many people, like Stephen Cummings mainly. And I just thought, I'm just going to throw this sort of hodgepodge of songs together. So one minute might be, and, and rearrange them. So I'm doing I Want to Break Free, Queen. Oh. But as a sort of Heath Glass type sort of... Philip Glass. Hmm? Philip Glass? Philip Glass. So who's Keith Glass? The country Glass. <laughs> well, I'm not doing it like Keith. No, I'm doing it. <laughs> well, Keith Glass. Keith Glass. Keith, yeah, Keith, Glass. <laughs> Keith Glass began a go-go record, I think, maybe with Bruce Milne, and yes. also managed the birthday party early on. I oh, hope God. I got that right. Yeah, well, that's probably my mistake. Yeah. All right, I so once, Philip Glass. I once played with a drummer called Barnaby Gold and I introduced him as Barnaby Joyce. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to be careful. Of he course. Did, and didn't go down well. Uh, I heard there might be a Seekers song on the collection. Yeah, I'm going there. Not you sure. weren't one of those uh, 200,000 people at the Maya Music Bowl in 1967, were you? No, I wasn't, but I was obsessed with Judith Durham. I just loved her voice. I still do. And um, we did the fantastic... Rock Wiz at the Bowl. Yeah, what anniversary yeah. was that? Uh, well, what was a paying tribute to uh, 50 years of the Maya Music Bowl. That's right. And Billy Miller and I did um, World of Our Own with the Rock Quiz yeah. Orchestra. And that was a fantastic night. Incredible. Yeah, and probably knowing that Judith Durham was in the wings watching. Yeah. Remember when she got up and it was a, quite a warm night and this warm breeze came and ruffled her dress a bit and it was just, it was magic. It was a big blood moon. Yes. Exactly. Don't you know I can exactly. remember things? Yeah, of course you can. Hey, speaking of backing vocals, one quick question. Yeah. What, what, uh, what excites you about a singer who you're singing backing vocals for? Like, what, what are the ones that you really look for? Um, probably, well, you know, to, to have a similar tone like Stephen and I did. Well, I mean, when you hear us individually, we don't sound anything alike, but we blended so well. So I guess you're always looking for that blend that is, um, he, he's, it was great singing with him. I, I, I always loved the sound that we made together. I've sung backing vocals for so many people. It's hard to, it's hard to really, Put my finger on it. I think that who you go. No, no, you have to. Um, it helps if you like them. Of course. You know, course. and if you've got some rapport, and then you the the chemistry works, and yeah. yeah. I think that's the very first time you and I and Shane met. Was uh, I was doing some poetry at the Royal. Derby was it and Stephen was doing a residency perhaps every Thursday night yes and I remember he rang me up and I I hung up on him because I thought it was my pal Streety pretending to be Stephen <laughs> 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 oh that's funny we had some good times yeah, yeah. all right well we better we better wrap it up with okay. the final song what what are you going to leave us with well we, we'll leave you with, we'll just do a short version because I don't want to hog the show. Thanks for sitting there patiently, everyone. Yeah, um, they're all watching. Yeah. Okay, so this is, um, this is a Bill Withers song called Grandma's Hands. And um, we recorded this for Brian Wise on Triple R. Yes. He, he was desperate for some mm. new content. So, um We'll it's a beautiful it song. Brief. A beautiful song. Yeah, Bill Withers. Huh. Yeah. Rest in peace. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Shane. Thanks, Brian.
absolutely superb. Rebecca Barnard with Shane O'Mara. Thank you so Thank much. You Grandma's much. hands. You scared me with the look. You made me ring, play the wrong chord. Off you go now. <laughs> Thank you, you two. Great to have you both uh, there at the uh, so Yikes. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Hey, stick around. Yeah. We'll, get you to, we'll get you to say goodbye at the end. Yeah. Lovely to have you here. And uh, as I mentioned to Rebecca the other day, there is an incredible documentary on Bill Withers called Still Bill, and it's available on the uh, YouTube station. All right. Our next guest is pretty excited. She's just released her first single, Better Things, and I'm very pleased to welcome First Nations song woman, Kian, a name coming from the Wick people, meaning to sing, to dance, to play. But I tell you what, Kian, I reckon you will explain the background to that name a lot more eloquently than me. So give us the background. Firstly, hello, Kian. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, really great. You got Ella there on the cello right next to you. G'day, Ella. So yeah, just a little background to the to the name and your background, in fact, Kian. Yeah, so I am um, proud Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman. Um, my family, my connections are Gugu Yalanji, um, which is north of Cairns in the um, rainforest. Um, Jirabu, which is southwest of Cairns. Um, near Tully, and then um, my mum is Torres Strait Islander, she's from Bardu Island. Um, but my parents, they are both creative, my dad's a singer, my mum was like a 90s hip hop dancer, and they wanted to name me that something that kind of um, encapsulates both of their loves. <laughs> um, so they named me Kian, like you said, it means to dance, to sing, to play, and it's from the Wick Mob, which me and my dad are connections to up in Cape York. Um, yeah. And have you have you always been aware that that is the sort of derivation of your name right from the beginning to dance, to sing and to play? Yeah, um, they've told me that story since I was little. Um, I have always kind of just gravitated towards dancing and singing from yeah, a baby. Um, my mum told a really cute story last night because we were video chatting after the release about um, how when we lived at my grandma's house that my grandma heard me playing underneath the stairs and heard me singing um, The Little Mermaid like, ah, as a toddler and, and it was a cute story. <laughs> Well, that's a beautiful uh, connection to Rebecca's song. I did read that you, you said that you come from a line of disruptors. Yeah, that's right. Um, Who was doing the most disrupting? Uh, I don't know. I think I wanted that line to there because um, I come from some really strong black women. My grandma was one of them. Um, she raised my aunties and uncles um, as a single mother. My mum's also a strong black Torres Strait a woman. Um, yeah, it's, I guess that's what I meant by disruptors in that sense of uh, well, I did see some footage of you performing at a, a Melbourne venue, the Northcote Social Club, and I saw your dad on stage with you. Tell us about his influence in your life. Uh, my dad is yeah definitely one of the biggest influences. Um, we've been singing since I was little. He's a singer as well. Um, did some opera stuff and does some acting. Um, always doing something creative um, since I was little. But um, I don't know. I kind of just learned from him, and we'd sing Ella Fitzgerald in the car, picking me up from school, and on, on the way home. Um, yeah, we did some musicals together as well, and he's just a big... big some fan. musicals? Yeah. Um, so we, back in Townsville, which is where I, I'm from, but I'm in Melbourne at the moment, um, where we did Hairspray and Rent, and then he's done, like, Grease and Middle of Mantua, and, yeah. How great for, to, to be in those musicals with your dad. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's, it's been such 
fond memory. I'm going to tell my kids that and hopefully they can be in musicals with me. <laughs> And uh, am I right in thinking that they used to take you to the Woodford Folk Festival? Yeah, that's right. Um, I think it was yeah a couple of years ago, we were like, oh, we need to celebrate the new year. What are we going to do? And we saw that one of my our favourite bands, um, Lake Street Dive, were playing. So we literally, like the night before, said, we're going to Woodford. And then the next morning, jumped in the car really early in the morning and just drove from Townsville to Woodford stayed there for yeah to see Lake Street dive and then drove up again so like two days 28 hours of driving just to see Lake Street dive and it, we've gone back to Woodford every year since <laughs> and you performed there this la this year yeah yeah so um this year I yeah fulfilled a dream um so wonderful um I went with this deadly collective called the Homelands Tour who bring um established and um, emerging indigenous musicians and artists together from across the world. We had a young girl from Moose Factory in Northern Ontario in Canada come over. She was First Nations like woman. Um, yep. She sung as well at Woodford. It was just yeah, an amazing experience. And you mentioned that your mum was a hip hop dancer. Did she ever perform at Woodford? No, she didn't. Uh, she would have been shame. Um, no, but we did some like '90s hip hop dancing just at our tent. We were like grooving to, um, yeah, some Michael Jackson songs, and yeah, it was wonderful. Um, and my standard question, which uh, which has to come to you as well, Kian, uh, a six or a seven year old Kian, what what sort of things were you doing to amuse yourself? Um, I was pretending that I was a performer, like I listened to Destiny's Child and uh, a lot of the Beatles and I'd just be like singing and dancing in my room, like pretending there was an audience and just like rocking out um, to my CDs. So that's, that's what I was doing. <laughs> and it's, the dream has come true. That's it, yeah. yeah. It's incredible. Well, congratulations on the new single. It's a beautiful piece of work uh, and, and it's got a lovely backstory, which is a, a connection between your home in Townsville and also coming to Melbourne. Can you give us a little little bit of that story? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so the song Better Things is about um, me trying to, I guess, find myself or just become a better version of myself. Um, when I moved to Melbourne, I was struggling a lot. Um, I speak about mental health and my anxiety a lot in my music. Um, so Better Things is kind of just about addressing that and um, you know finding that support system, but also like being a bit grateful um, for what you have and um, the future of what's to come. Um, yeah, that's what the song's about. Kian, have you found Melbourne a, a, a welcoming city? I mean, I imagine it's a, it's a big jump coming from FNQ and, and coming to uh, the Big Smoke. Has it been welcoming to you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I've made a lot of good friends. I think the best connection that I have is that there's so many people going through the same thing with Melbourne. It's that, that wonderful place where everyone just... Um, travels to and um, connects with because there's so many new people there and so many people wanting to live a, a, the dream yeah. kind of, so yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and how's your reconciliation week been? Yeah, it's been really good. Um, yeah, a lot of reflecting and um, just thinking about the better things to come um, for my mob and for my friends and for the community. Um, yeah. Well, we're delighted that you've been part of uh, episode four of At Home with Brian. So if you want to get yourself uh, organised, we'll, we'll close with that song. You've got Ella there on uh, the cello. You're in the Scrap Museum room at the fabulous Bakehouse Studios. And uh, take us out with that beautiful song.
Absolutely beautiful. We're all clapping our little hearts out. Kian with a brand new song called Better Things. A little bit of help from Ella on the cello. Thank you both and uh, stick around and say goodbye just after our next guest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. Finally, from Dorset in the UK and that's where he is. A man schooled in boogie woogie piano by none other than the great Ian Stewart, founding member of the Rolling Stones, a regular visitor to Australia with Ashley Davies on the drums and Sweet Felice on the bass guitar. Uh, a man who plays with Ronnie Wood from time to time. I'm delighted to welcome to At Home with Brian, Mr. Ben Waters. How are you, Ben? Yeah, good, thanks, Brian. It's great to see you again. Great to have you here. Ben and I have done a couple of uh, ABC sessions. We recorded a live album in the studio. I think I was even uh, hoisted up onto the stage with you at Port Ferry and uh, really could just watch in amazement as you tore the house down. How are you going in the lockdown, Ben? Well, it, it, fantastically, really, because I've spent like 30 years just travelling non-stop. So it's a real shock to the system, um, you know, just being in one place. And it's, it's lovely because my son Tom's home from uni, my daughter's home. And, um, and it, we're just having this love because he, he's off to uni uh, studying at the Royal Academy of Music in London. And so yes. sort of basically left home, really. And, um, but they got shut down like three months before the end of the term, you know, so it's really nice having the whole family back together without any of us being away and just spending lots of time together. And we've got this amazing weather in England. Like It's got to be something to do with no pollution, but um, we've yeah. never, they said it's the sunniest um, spring that's ever happened in England. So um, really, yeah, it's just unbelievable. So, uh, I mean, we haven't got any money. We, there's no work and there's nothing else, but we're just having this wonderful time. And sometimes that's more important than anything else, you know. So. And you're having this great family time. Speaking of family, the last time I met Tom was at the ABC. 
And am I right in thinking that there was a great story about Tom being found in either a guitar case or a, a saxophone case? Yeah, well actually um, you mentioned Ian Stewart earlier and he came from Pitt and Ween in Fife in Scotland. And like, I guarantee, like, it's 28 degrees down here now. I don't guarantee it, but, like, um, usually it's, like, 10, 15 degrees colder up there. And uh, so yep. Tom Tom was five years old. We flew up to uh, Edinburgh to do this uh, special tribute concert to uh, Ian Stewart. Ian Stewart had two bands, the Rolling Stones and another band called Rocket 88. And Rocket 88 had all sorts of people playing it. I think Jimmy Page played in it, Charlie Watts played in it. Um, uh, all sorts of people played in it. So anyway, they got the band back together to do this special concert in Pitt and Ween. And it was just freezing. And me and Tom had driven up and, uh, and it was just like um, in shorts and T-shirt. Just got there in time to play. It was freezing cold. He said, Dad, I'm cold. And I said, well, I haven't got any warm clothes. I just thought it was summertime. So um, the only thing I could do was zip him into a suitcase. And I propped him up next to the band, uh, next to the four saxophone players. And we started playing. And at the end of the night, he said, can I play saxophone? And the rest is history, really. And... Uh, now he's teaching Dad how to play. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, let's let's just hear a little bit about Ian Stewart. Um, incredible story, as you said. He was a founding member of the Rolling Stones. Uh, sadly, their manager Andrew Lou Goldham felt that he didn't quite have the look to be a Rolling Stone, which is a bit tough when you look at uh, your Bill Wyman's and your Keats in those early days. What's the nature of your relationship with Stu? Well, um, with Stu, um, like he said, he was very unceremoniously sacked at the time. And um, I've, he, um, what happened was that Andrew Lou Golden got, um, f you know, five suits for the band. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so how many of them in there? Um, Keith? Oh. Um, yeah, five. He was, he was called the Sixth Stone. But when they went to, um, they were doing a photo shoot. And when he got there, there was only five suits. And he said, where's my suit? And they said, well, you haven't got one. You're not in the band anymore. And he was the only one with a proper job. And he'd just given it up um, to go on tour with the Stones, you know. And uh, so he, that was it. He'd lost his career. And he said, can I stay on as a van driver? So he stayed on. But he's a very humble man. And, you know, I think they all absolutely loved him. And they listened to him more than anyone. Because he would, he would say things to them like, "You can't play blues in a minor key. It's got to be, it's got to be major." And like, there's, um, there's a, there's a famous uh, album over here with Robert Cray in a band called um, Blues and Trouble, and it's called No Minor Keys in honor of Ian Stewart. So he, he would oh, say yeah. all, all those things like Worried Life Blues. He said, "Never play minor, minor. It's got to be major." And that goes against a lot of what other people think, but that's how Stu thought, and he just loved all that muddy water stuff. In he. <clears throat> Though he was a humble man and very quiet, there wouldn't have been any Rolling Stones without him, probably, because, you know, it, um, Brian Jones put an advert in the paper and he answered it, and then the rest of the band joined. But there wouldn't have been any smoke on the water without him because uh, that he recorded that in the Stones mobile, um, you know, and he played with Led Zeppelin, didn't he? He played on rock and roll and they did uh, Boogie for Stu, Boogie with Stu, sorry. Um, uh, and so, like, he's, he's very, so many things happened in England because of that man but nobody knows his name, which is quite kind of sad. I was very lucky. I most probably wouldn't have heard of him, but my aunt and uncle were friends with him. And um, so he used to come down to Dorset. I only met him the once and uh, he brought this band Rocket 88 to play at my aunt and uncle's 25th wedding anniversary. So, um, so we went down and watched him play there. But um, years later, when I started playing piano, my aunt and uncle, um, because they were such good friends with them, they still got his original piano They've got his stereo, which used to be the front of house um, uh, uh, PA for the Stones on, on big gigs. Yeah. And they're, they're great big speakers like in their front room. And they also, more importantly, had all his record collection and cine footage and videos. And this stuff that's never been released of Muddy Waters, you know, in, in his front room and stuff like that. You know, um, absolutely incredible. You know, so I had all this access way before YouTube or anything like that. So it was just yeah. incredible for me, really. And I learned by copying him, he had videos, they had videos of Rocket 88 and the, the video camera was set up just above his hands. So I, I ended up copying him. And then when Rocket 88 found out that I'd copied him, they said, well, can you come and join our band? So I went off on tour all over the place with them. Brilliant. I, I do notice there is a piano uh, at very close proximity to you, Ben. Could you just perhaps illustrate that Ian Stewart style for us? 
Could we just, just a little bit of the way... Uh, His, um, his yeah. timing was great, and um, and you know he used to do things that he would change the chord in the right hand before the left hand, which used to, used to melt me. You know, you go home. Like... I'm not doing it very well, but you know it's those kind of things that just when he played them, he just sort of seemed to have a very good. Um, it's almost like BB King on the guitar. You know, he just do stuff that melt melted you. That, that no one else would do. No, yeah. How great that we've got you. And of course, you recorded that incredible tribute album to him. Uh, you, I think, am I right in thinking you were able to corral all the Rolling Stones? Well, it's, um, yes. I mean, the thing was, I, 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 I learned by copying Ian Stewart. And then I and ended up in a band with Charlie Watts, just by coincidence. Yeah. And then we would be in the back of vans and he'd be telling me all the stories of Ian Stewart. And I said, I've always wanted to make a tribute album to him. And he said, well, I'll play drums on it if you like. And so um, he said, phone the Rolling Stones office. So I phoned my friend Sherry Daly that was running the Stones office at the time. Phoned her up and said, look, you know, I'm doing this stuff with Charlie. He won't be available this weekend. And she was having lunch with Ronnie Wood. And he said, well, what are you doing? And so she told him and he said, well, can I play guitar on it? And then, um, so uh, anyway, um, I told phone Charlie up and said, uh, Ronnie's playing guitar on it. And he said, well, he was best friends, Stu was best friends with Keith. Keith's gonna be really pissed off if you if you suddenly got Ronnie on it and he's not on it, you better phone him. So I phoned Keith and um, then Keith ended up saying he would play on it. And then uh, Keith said, well, you, you know, you've got three of the stones on it, you better ask, um, ask Mick, you know. So and it, it, it snowballed like that. And then Bill came in and played. And I think that was the first time Bill had played with all the stones for nearly 20 years, I think. Yeah. How was the atmosphere? Fantastic, yeah, really good. And Jules Holland played organ, I played piano. And Tom, right. Tom here, was nine years old, and he snuck in with the, with the horn section. They said, come on, Tom. And then um, he ended up playing with the stones at nine years old. <laughs> Brilliant. Speaking of the stones, the last time I saw a little bit of footage of you was uh, playing piano behind Ronnie Wood. He's made a, an album, a tribute album, to Chuck Berry. Uh, how does, I mean, I know Chuck Berry, you know, primarily a, a guitarist, but he had a terrific pianist too, didn't he? Johnny Johnson. Yeah, he did. John, Johnny Johnson, another one that Stu was a massive fan of and, and, and not too dissimilar in their playing in, in some ways. And uh, Johnny Johnson had the Johnny Johnson trio um, out of St. Louis in um, Missouri. And then Chuck Berry came and joined that trio. And uh, I think that's why it's Johnny Be Good, because it was Johnny's band, you know. So, uh, yeah. and, uh, so he, he was a terrific piano player. And uh, so uh, I, I love Johnny Johnson and I, I love Chuck as well, you know, but um, Ronnie Wood was a massive Chuck Berry fan and he'd worked with him. I was a massive Johnny Johnson fan and I'd done a bit of work with Chuck Berry as well. So um, we just got talking one night and um, said we should do a tribute album because nobody had done anything we, that we knew of. So um, we got together and we had this concert in a, uh, well, um, Ronnie phoned me up. We had t two concerts in Ronnie Scott's in London. And he said, we better have a warm up for it. So I said, well, I'll just hire the local theatre. We can rehearse in the daytime and then we'll do a gig in the evening. So we did the gig and we met up about five o'clock, rehearsed for two hours and the doors open at seven. We did the concert and unbeknown to me, it was recorded. And um, Ronnie said, that sounds pretty good, this kind of thing. So the next thing I knew, it was released as an album. But the, the other thing with Ronnie Wood is you never know what's going to happen because um, it wasn't meant to be just us. And he said, I, um, he just turned up with a singer called Imelda May. And like Imelda's yeah. just like an incredible singer from Ireland. So she turned up. The next night we played, he turned up with Rob Stewart. And he sang. And the next night he turned up, he turned up with Johnny Depp and Jeff Beck. So um, that's the thing with Ronnie, and they all played. So you never know what's going to happen with Ronnie. So uh, he's like, um, he's something special about him. He, he just, 
he's like a sponge that pulls like you know all these things together and makes some incredible things happen it's just so that album was just a, a, a wing and a prayer and it came together like that and and I, I think all the better for it really well, and in a way, you could probably argue that he's held the Stones together as a sort of a connection between Keith and Mick. I think things were a bit rocky for a while there. Ronnie's obviously got that spirit. Yeah, he has. He's he's very, um, yeah, he's, I, I don't know, he's just a lovely guy. He's very thoughtful, kind, and, um, you know, and I think that's very difficult in his position, actually, because everybody wants a, a piece of him, like whether it's, people wanting autographs or people wanting him to do gigs or yeah. promoters wanting he's pulled in every direction but he's very centered and and very thoughtful and kind the whole time and and a yeah. lot of fun you know so i think that's why people like him you know and i think ben we'll we'll get a full song from you uh, to finish off but just before that i wanted to ask you about one of the greats who sadly left left us uh, a month or so ago a uh, little richard wow now um we were just talking me and tom about little richard and um, uh, I was on tour with Charlie Watts, and this sort of sums little Richard up to me. And um, Charlie was saying that they did the first ever tour of England with um, little Richard. Another friend of mine, Willie Garnett, was playing saxophone with him. But the, the lineup was the Everly Brothers, um, uh, the Rolling Stones, little Richard. And the Everly Brothers were the top of the bill because they were selling the most records in England at the time. Yep. So uh, Charlie said that um, after three days, the Everly Brothers went to the manager and said, please don't make us go on after Little Richard. No one can follow me. It's just insane. <laughs> and then Charlie said he'd go and watch. He said because, you know, it was a young Little Richard back then as well. So he said they, they, he'd kick off with Lucille at a million miles an hour and the poor drummer would be going like this. And he said, he said he'd just go and watch because his veins would be popping out of his neck trying to keep up. And, um, yep. and he said and Little Richard would jump off the stage, run out the fire exit, run down the street, all these people screaming behind him. And the theatre would be like a thousand seater. He'd come back in through the front doors and come back in and jump on stage. And then there was like 3000 people in because they all knew it was going to happen. And they all just charged into the theatre. And, uh, um, but that, that, again, he was like a tour de force. I saw him on his 60th birthday. He was most probably the best concert I've ever seen. He was just incredible. Can you just illustrate again, using the piano that just a little bit of what what made Little Richard very special. Yeah, okay. You gonna play along, Tom? Yeah, and he just had hit after hit. And when you when you look at the titles, you know, Slippin' and Slidin', Good Golly Miss Molly, The Girl Can't Help It, Lucille, they just kept coming, didn't they? I think he, he had an amazing rhythm section. Earl Palmer on drums is one of my favourite drummers ever. They did that Bama Lama Bama Lou. Yeah. But that, that's one of those tunes, Bama Lama Bama Lou. I was in a bar in Nashville, not Nashville, in Austin, Texas. And I, I always quite liked it, but I, they had it on so loud and it just thought, God, this sounds good. And it's one of those ones you've got to just crank it up and you just realise how brilliant it is, you know. Yeah, incredible. Ben Waters, uh, delighted to, to have you on the show. Are we seeing you again in Australia? We love you down here. Are you going to come, gonna come back? back? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to, yeah. Um, I was cutting back from touring because I say after 30 years of just non-stop touring i was gonna um sort of cut back to only a few a few dates a year but um we we love australia so much i really missed coming there this year so um my friend derek nash is going to play sax and i'm going to play piano sweet felicia and ash hopefully we want to come back and do port ferry if they'll have us and because that's that was just yeah. it's a magical place isn't it it's just wonderful that festival it's pretty special isn't it you know when when you took the stage at the shabeen tent and that whole room is rocking. They couldn't get you off. I just love it there. It's one of my favorite festivals I've ever been to anywhere. It's just great. It's pretty special. It's pretty special. All right, Ben, uh, thank you so much. And Tom, what would you, what will you leave us with? Let's have a full song. I think we'll do a little Richard tune. Well, I, I don't know who did it originally. It was um, 
but I, I, it's called Send Me Some Loving. So I, it, this, goes, this goes out for a little Richard because I, I'm really going to miss him because I thought he was just incredible. So it's going to feature Tom on the sax. So here we go. All right. Thank you, Ben Waters. <laughs> from Dorset in the UK, father and son, Tom Waters, Ben Waters, Tom playing the Lee Allen part, Ben playing the Richard Pennyman part. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Brian. It's, it's been an honour to play with all these guys. You know, I, I just thought um, Rebecca and Shane were fantastic and Rock, Ke um, Kian and Ella. It's a lovely name, Kian, isn't it? <laughs> well, you can all say day to each other and then you can say goodbye. <laughs> Thanks ever so much for letting us play. It was wonderful. Thank you. Oh, Rebecca. Isn't it amazing that you're playing with your son? I play with my son. Your your mum and dad, Kian, were in music too. Like it's just it's so great. That's what keeps it all going. That your your parents are never gonna say get a real job. And your dad's never gonna say to you get a real job. So <laughs> <laughs> Is that right, Tom? Yeah, I'm I'm very thankful to have a dad like my dad is. It's great fun. <laughs> we just we just play every night. It's good fun. Thank you all. Thank you, Kian. Thank you, Ella. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Shane. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. We'll see you next time.